who steal sensitive data from thousands of systems. So um, hopefully you guys can find some uses for it. So my presentation outline is just to go over what uh, OpenDLP is, why did I write it, uh, how does it work, I'll show some benchmarks against some agentless scanners, and then I'll go through a, a live demo just to show you how it works. So hopefully it won't blow up. Um, and then my future plans, and if there's some time, we can take some uh, questions. But what is OpenDLP? It's a, it's a data discovery tool, and it has two components. There's a web app, and there's an agent. And the web app controls the agents, essentially. The web app is uh, the LAMP stack, so it's uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and Perl. And the agent only runs on Windows right now. I've released it under the GPL version 3, uh, so it's free and open source. You guys can do whatever you want with it. And uh, it's most useful for uh, compliance personnel like PCI guys who maybe want to go out and see what systems in their environment or their, their, their uh, customer's environment has that PAN data on their systems. It's also useful for uh, proactive network and sysadmins. So if you've got a lot of systems in your environment, maybe you want to see if those laptops that are out in the field have any PAN or SOCH numbers on them. But uh, I'll let you in on a little secret. I know you guys are very, uh, very tight-lipped and, and trust, uh, trustworthy, but uh, the real reason why I wrote this was for pen testing as a post-exploitation tool. So after you get domain admin on your pen test in like the first few hours or so, uh, why don't you give this a run, see what's on those thousands of systems, and uh, maybe impress some C-level executives. So why did I write it? Well, previously there wasn't really any agent-based solution. You could hack up some free stuff. Uh, there's, there's a Cornell Spider, it's a, a, a Visual Basic Visual C GUI thing. Uh, but you would have to map a network share and essentially use it as an agentless scanner. And it doesn't really scale well. It's good for maybe one or two systems at a time. And I'll go through some benchmarks a little bit later to, to show that. Uh, but as I said, they're just not really practical for large deployments. So in the uh, infamous words of uh, Shaggy 2 Dope, how does it work? So uh, if there are any juggalos in the audience, don't worry, it's, it has nothing to do with magnets. So I'm just going to kind of fly through these because I'm going to duplicate these in the demo. But um, if you first one thing you want to do is create a policy. And you can reuse these policies, kind of like what you do in Nessus. So each scan you do, you can reuse the same policy. You want to fill out the admin credentials. You have to be an admin or a domain admin because you have to start this as a service in Windows. Uh, you can also, in the policy, define directories and file extensions to either whitelist or blacklist. You can set a ceiling for the agent in memory so it won't take up more than a percent of the system, the physical system memory, and then it won't uh, cause any thrashing. And then some, um, some, some other things you can do, uh, obviously set the regexes you want to use. It uses PCREs, so I assume all you guys should be familiar with PCREs or you probably would not be here. Uh, and then some minor things, uh, you can set how many agents to concurrently deploy and you can set whether to obfuscate that info when it comes back to you. So we're all hackers. I mean, we don't really want to obfuscate stuff. That's kind of lame. But there's an option there in case you're a compliance guy and you're concerned about having that data on your own system. And then uh, how often it phones home, because the agents will phone home with results every so, so many seconds, and you can, that's, that's configurable. So then once your policy is set, you would just want to simply start a scan. The agent itself is deployed over SMB. By default, if a system, if a Windows system is in a domain environment, you can mount its drives, like the C dollar share. Uh, you, it'll also start with the WinEXE e, win extension of Samba, so it's a lot like SysInternals PSExec, it's just a Linux variant of it. And as I said before, you can concurrently deploy these scanners. So you, instead of, if you want to scan a thousand systems, you don't want to deploy a thousand all at once, because that's going to launch a thousand different WinEXE and, and Samba write uh, processes. But also, on, on the flip side, you don't want to send them out one at a time, because that's just going to take forever. So what you can do is kind of strike a balance, say maybe 30, 50, or 100 at a time. And once they're deployed, the next ones will fill that queue until they're all out there. So the agent will uh, deploy to Windows systems. And I've written the agent in C. And there are no .NET requirements. Because if you're going to scan 1,000 or 2,000 systems, 
you will run into those old 2000 or XP boxes that don't come by default with .NET. And if I wrote it in .NET, it wouldn't be really much fun. So um, it, it uses open source libraries. Uh, the agent itself, it runs as a service in the background. So if the box gets bounced, it's going to pick up where it left off. It also runs as a low priority service. So the user is really not going to see or feel anything. It's, it's even less intense than antivirus, which isn't really saying much. But trust me. <laughs> It, uh, as I said before, it limits itself to a percent of memory. So let's say your system has a gig of memory and you want to sc scan a 10 gig file. It's not going to try to load that 10 gig file at once. It's going to chop it up into like 100 meg chunks or 10 meg chunks and it'll be a lot nicer to the system. And uh, once it gets going, it's going to first whitelist and blacklist those files and extensions. It's going to then obviously begin searching for the data. And then every so often it's going to upload that data back to the web app that is under your control, like your laptop. And then finally, when it's done scanning, uh, it'll say to the web, web, web app, like, hey, I'm all done. Come uninstall me. And the web app will uninstall it and delete all the files. And there'll really be no trace. 99.9% .9 of your users or your victims uh, won't really notice it running or even knew it would know it was there in the first place. So inside the web app, while it's running, or even after the agent is done, you can re it'll, it'll receive the results every so often. Uh, and, and the stuff that's sent are the current status of the agent, whether it's doing the whitelisting, blacklisting stuff, or whether it's actually scanning. And you'll get a little status, a little progress bar, based on how many files and bytes it's scanned so far. And the web app can pause and uninstall agents at any time. So if your customers or if your boss starts getting a little uh, leery that your, your scans might be doing something bad to a file system or to someone's laptop, you can just pause it or just completely uninstall it from all or just a few systems. And then, as I said before, the agent will send a message to the web app to have it uninstall. Uh, inside the web app, while it's running, you can review the results both at a high level and you can drill down into the actual findings. So uh, if you think, if you, if you drill down to a system, you can see that this file has this sensitive info at this byte offset. And you can even download that file to verify whether it's actually there. So I know what you're thinking. Uh, which, why did you just basically invented multiplayer grep? Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> so some benchmarks. Um, I, I tried this on a fairly modern system uh, on a 100 megabit network. And the agent w went through two gigs of data with 13 regexes in just over an hour. So uh, with just one regex, it took about nine minutes. So there is some overhead where you've got to blacklist and whitelist files, read the files into memory for processing. But now on the flip side, an agentless scanner, it has to download those files across the network to your own system. So that, that is a bit, that's a, uh, co quite a bit more time to, to do. So for 13 regexes, it's not so bad. It's an hour and 20. But for just one regex, it's nearly 22 minutes. So you can see that an agent list under optimal conditions will eventually catch up to an agent-based solution. But if you're only going to run a couple regexes, it can be up to twice as slow. And that's only just for one system. So now what if we extrapolate this to, let's say, a few thousand systems? Well, remember now, the, the agent list scanner it took, uh, it has to download stuff, so I, I timed this, and it takes about 22% of the scan time to download the files. And that means you can only do about six systems at once before you hit a threshold of degrading each, each download's uh, performance. And likewise, the CPU time is, it takes up nearly 80%. So really, you can only do barely one system on a single core system. And if you're doing a quad-core system, you can do about five before you start running into throttling issues. So I've got some pretty graphs. Um, oh, good, you can see them. Uh, the, if you, if you want to scan up to 25 systems, with just a single-core agentless scanner, it would take over a day. Whereas my open DLP agent will take just about one hour. And what's really cool is if you want to scan 2,000 systems, my open DLP thing will just take an hour. But a single core system would take almost 90 days. Now, I don't know how many of your customers are willing to scope a pen test for 90 days, but uh, that's, that's probably going to be a quite profitable project. <laughs> 
So the, the, the results of the benchmark, uh, obviously agent base is faster, and there are two reasons why. So you've got the victim systems doing the calculations themselves. It's like a distributed project. You also have to only uh, transmit a very small amount of data. You're, the agent itself is only one meg in size, and the data that it phones home with is also very small. You're only phoning home with the results and some logs. On, on the flip side, the agentless downsides, uh, you've got to download all those files to your own system because it's your own system that's doing those computations. And also you've got to download the files over SMB and SMB is not exactly the most efficient file transfer protocol. So I thought I would do a live demo and the title of my talk is Stealing Data from Thousands of Systems and Bruce said there's gonna be 1,600 people here. So what I thought would be great is if you guys all booted to Windows and turned off your firewalls, join the ShmooCon network and add a local admin user for me. So if you could name it Andy, and just let's make a password a password. I don't think anybody would guess that. So if you guys want to take a couple minutes and yeah, there are some signs coming up, I, I guess not. Okay. I've got it all uh, ready to go here. So what I'm doing is I've got my... I've, it, on my uh, Google code page, I've got a virtual box to download and it's all pretty much ready to go. So I'm gonna use that. And I've also got a Windows 7 guinea pig to, to scan. So the first thing you wanna do is set a scan, create a profile. So. We create a profile name, we'll just name it Shmookon. A username that has to be a local administrator and a password. The work group, um, I always like to install it under the program files because not everybody likes to look there. Uh, we'll limit it to maybe 1% of memory just so you can see. I've got a larger file here so you can see that it's chopping up in chunks. Um, I don't like to mask sensitive data because that's not as much fun. But if you are a policy person, you probably want to mask sensitive data, otherwise you become a liability. Uh, for this demo, I'm just gonna scan one directory. So I've got some test data in that directory. And this next thing, you can whitelist or blacklist file extensions, as I said. So these are typically just mostly movies, audio, and, and, and uh, music and stuff like that. And you can, you can select the uh, regexes here, so we'll select some uh, credit cards. By default, it comes with these 13, but you can always add your own. Uh, this tells the agent what things to treat as credit cards. So it'll run those numbers, that data through an extra mod 10 check just to try to cut down on false positives. And likewise, these, are, these, these options here, the zip extensions, tell the agent which file extensions to treat as zip files. So it will unzip those files and look inside them for fun stuff. The upload URL is the phone home URL and the username and password, it uses basic authentication. So let me just, I'm, I'm gonna fat finger this password if I try to type it. Uh, concurrent deployments, it doesn't really matter here. We're just doing it to one and a description and the log verbosity. We click submit and that creates a profile. The next thing we want to do then is to create or start a scan. So we'll name the scan something. We will select the profile that we just created and I think that's the IP. Let me just double check real quick. Yep, and your list of targets here. So you click scan or start. And you see here that it successfully deployed an agent to this system. If you were gonna deploy this to, to many systems, it would scroll on this page and you don't wanna leave this page, otherwise it's gonna interrupt the deployment. But eventually you'll see at the end, zero systems remain in queue. So you'll know that you're at the end and it's safe to leave. Uh, if we look now, at the Windows Task Manager, we can see that the agent is running at below normal priority. So it's, I really feel nothing. If, if I wanted to fire up a, a CPU intensive program, this open DLP agent would drop to zero. So if you want to run a John the Ripper crack or anything like that, uh, it, it's still fine. And you can also see it's limiting, limiting itself to just 1% uh, of memory. So if I've got two gigs in this VM, oh, it's done. I have two gigs in the VM, but it was limiting itself to just 20 megs, and it was also scanning a 40 meg file. So it did chop it up into segments. So now that the scan is done, we can go back and view the results. And here's that high level info that you can look for. And if we can drill down, we see it's 100% done. And here are 
the actual results. So for example, in this uh, blah.txt, you can see that we possibly found three SOCH numbers. We can click on that file and download it and open it. And we see, yeah, there's probably three SOCH numbers in here, one at zero byte offset, one at like 40 something, and one at 80 something. Now let's say that one of those was a false positive, so we can mark those as a false positive, scroll down, and if we go back, they're obviously gone. Or if we messed up and we accidentally messed, uh, marked something as a false positive, we can go and manage those false positives. And we'll just delete one of them. And if you go back to the scan results, you'll see that that, uh, that result is back in as a valid, valid finding. There it is. And when you're all done, you can uh, export the scan results as XML. So you can do with that what you want. Maybe you've got some sort of reporting engine that you use and you can parse this quite easily. But that's about it for the live demo. Um, go back to my presentation. So my future plans, um, I wanna make an agentless scanner. I know I've kind of shown that they're not really optimal for large deployments, but I think it would be, at least be good to have that option. Maybe a customer uh, doesn't want you to install something on a very sensitive system or who knows why, but there's at least that option. Uh, I also wanna add a feature to scan databases. So Microsoft SQL Server, uh, DB2, Oracle, all that good stuff. So it would go through and not only look at the data in the tables, but also the table names and the column names, because sometimes that will tip us off to some sensitive data that's out there. Uh, I also would like to add some features to output this in more usable formats for maybe non-technical people, people that aren't at this conference. Uh, Excel seems to be a reasonable output format. I also wanna add trending graphs. So let's say you're doing week to week or month to month scans of a system and you're trying to, to fix these data leak issues in your environment and then you can have a nice little Excel graph that uh, has a line graph going down, down, down and down and make your CIO really happy. Uh, kind of more pie in the sky uh, features that I would like to add is Metasploit integration, some sort of delivery agent where Metasploit, once you gain a shell or, or, or have it as a, um, an option to execute open DLP instead of like a, just a normal shell, and, that, uh, and then Metasploit would then talk back and forth to set up with the web app the stuff it needs on the back end and then launch the, uh, the agent with the policy and that way then uh, the agent can just phone home directly to the web app and, and Metasploit is then out of the picture. Um, I was on the uh, Exotic Liability podcast a few weeks ago and uh, Chris and Ryan mentioned that it'd be cool to have a portable agent option so they could put it on a USB stick and on their, pen te their physical pen tests or social engineering assessments and they could just hand it to somebody and it would auto run and know where to phone home and all that stuff so I think that'd be really cool. Uh, and then finally what I was going to do is I was going to expand this to more like a, a full-fledged uh, DLP agent and uh, have it be able to monitor PCs for maybe someone emailing something sensitive or copying something to a, to a USB file. But in the meantime, just a few weeks ago, a new project released its first version called MyDLP, and that's exactly what they do. It's, it's more of the client protection of DLP. And if you wanna check them out, it looks really, really promising. They're at mydlp.org, and I know they'll be, uh, they'll be happy to, to see the downloads and you guys using it. It's also open source and free. Uh, the availability, I'm out on Google Code, so opendlp.googlecode.com, uh, current version 025, and the VM is based on 022, but it's quite easy to update, just uh, copy the new stuff over and you have to uh, just do a couple database to add a, add a couple columns to a table in a database. And uh, that's my email and my Twitter account. And that's it, so. So there's a question, uh, someone asked about wildcards. Uh, so maybe if in the blacklisting or whitelisting of the, the, that, that feature to let's say you only wanna, you wanna scan the documents and settings folder, but you don't wanna scan maybe certain users or you want to not scan a parent directory, but you wanna scan the children's directories. Um, I do plan to add that feature soon. Just uh, depends on my time, but uh, I can't read that.
You can just shout it out. I'm sorry? Support for Outlook PST files. Right now, all my thing does is essentially greps. So um, it is something I can look at supporting individual file formats. That'd be probably a great one to start with. Uh, but it doesn't support it right now unless it's in, in plain text as a string in the file, in the binary file. False positive rate. False positive rate. <laughs> no false positives. Come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's an issue right now. And um, I think in, in the future I'll implement some sort of heuristics to cut that down. I try to try to to take uh, at least one stab away from uh, one stab at it with the the credit cards to at least run them through mod 10, and I want to. Someone sent me um, some social number verification stuff too, so I can use that uh, that that library with social numbers. I'll roll that into a, a future release, uh, but but I think heuristics will be the way to go. Yeah. Does, he asked, does, one, does it run once and then just clears itself up? And yes, that's how it currently is set up. So it's not persistent on the system. If you wanted to run it a second time, you would have to go through the starting a new scan again. I, I wanted to make it so it didn't really leave anything behind as more of a post-exploitation -exploita pen testing tool. Anybody else? Bueller? Bueller? Oh, okay. Well, I ran it on a Windows 7 system just now, and I guess I don't know how I got around it because it just works. <laughs> um, when you go in as, a, as an administrator, you can run something as the system account to install as a service, and that's how it runs as a service. And it hasn't been flagged by antivirus yet, so, um, <laughs> which would be interesting because those antivirus companies have commercial versions of this product. Yeah. Are false positive hard to, cro hard to cross off against all machines? Not right now, but that is something I want to add. So it, right now, the scanner will track MD5 signatures of that file. So if you want to mark something as a false positive across all systems with that MD5 or with that file name, that is something I will add in a future release. But not right now. Yeah. Can you scan while the Windows firewall is turned on? Uh, it depends on what they allow, because usually, even though a firewall is turned on, they, in, in a domain environment, they will sometimes still have port 445 open, for, for, because it's part of a domain, and you need, you need it to manage systems. Uh, if it cannot see port 445, it will not deploy the agent. And if it's a really strict firewall blocking egress stuff, egress filtering, because like, what this web app uses is port 443 for SSL it'll block that, then there's probably not a way around it unless I turn off the firewall, and that would definitely get me in trouble with antivirus companies. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right now it's just inside files. So uh, the question was, will it work for file names or just the contents of the file? So I'm sure if you have a file called ssn.txt, and there's no SSN inside that file, or maybe it's encoded with some proprietary, or maybe it's base64 encoded. It will not find that right now, but that is something I'm looking at, so. Yeah. The question is, uh, do I have any intent to make an API if you don't want to use the web app on a pen test? Uh, not right now, but it's certainly something that I think would be cool. It's, it's great to get these ideas, because um, if you, Keep, keep email, emailing these ideas to me and I can see about implementing them, it'd be cool. So the question is if you have a tunnel and you're maybe just not on a flat network, how do you get the phone home part to work back to you? Uh, right now, I will add some web proxy information. I, it uses libcurl for the web communications, and I do plan to at least add some username and password and proxy URL information. But beyond that, um, I think it would be kind of difficult to, to traverse the, those kind of uh, more complex situations. 
Anybody else? Otherwise, I'll cede to the next person. Okay, thank you guys.